I stick my arm in the bucket of molten lead and grab the thing and pull it out and you roll for go, it. Roll for it. You go, uh, <laughs> she melts your arm off. Like, I don't know what to say. Oh, um, there, there's not a roll for that. <laughs> I take a sledgehammer to a tower. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, yeah. So it's, it, it, it is, it's the player trust component. Yeah. Um, and then the, uh, toolbox component. On the Twitch stream and archived on our YouTube channel is a brand new show format. I and two other people in the RPG industry sit down and take turns, round robin, and ask each other questions, interview style. This is the audio from our first one. John Harper, Sean Nittner, and I ask each other questions and discuss a range of topics like what makes John Harper abandon an idea? How do I prepare for an interview? Why is Sean a popular collaborator in so many games? Currently, one of the games that Sean collaborated on is being crowdfunded by Evil Hat Games on GameFound. It's a second edition of the popular book Improv for Gamers. So if you want to level up your play, check it out before the campaign ends on May 5th. The link is in the show notes. The patron supporters are why I can put out content every week. A shout out to some of our newest patrons, Lucas Mayan, Dan Porter, Naomi Dempsey, and B-Match. Thanks to you and all of the other patrons. Okay, sit back, relax, and enjoy my time with Sean and John. Do you love to unplug and play games around the table? Greetings, friends and floorheads to Tabletop Talk from Third Floor Wars. If you love tabletop gaming, you are in the right place. Listen as Craig delivers in-depth discussions and interviews with game designers, creators, insiders, and experts. Learn from the people making and playing the role-playing, miniature, and board games you love. Howdy, friends and floor heads. Happy Tuesday afternoon. Um, I've been really looking forward to this. So what the hell are we doing here? Um, This started off as uh, John and I kind of chatting about interviewing and like, you know, what I do on the podcast and things like that. And somehow it got gamified, which is crazy, right, Uh, for uh, this to be turned into a game. Um, But here's the premise is we have three guests and we have three hosts and each of us is going to ask another a question. So for each of us get two questions. That's six questions total. Now, once the question is asked and answered, it is a free for all. We will discuss, have follow ups and work our way through it. So in the rare possibility that you don't know my two friends here, let's start off top left. John Harper, tell me about yourself. <laughs> Hello. Uh, I'm John Harper, as Craig said. I'm a game designer and graphic artist. I uh, do a lot of work with this other guy here uh, <laughs> for Evil Hat. Um, you may know me from games like Blades in the Dark and Lasers and Feelings and uh, Lady Blackbird, probably. All right. And my other friend here is Sean Nittner. Sean, tell us about yourself. Hey, Greg, thanks for having me on the show. Uh, I'm Sean. I use he, him pronouns. You can find me everywhere at Sean Nittner, uh, Gmail, Twitter, you know, where, wherever I am, that's, that's who I am. Um, po- both folks uh, most likely know me as the uh, director of projects for Evil Hat. That means I get to find amazing game designers like John Harper and work with them to publish games. And then every once in a while, like make a game together. That's not exactly the plan, but sometimes that's how it works out. It's like, (laughs) it's like when you're a sommelier and you get to taste great wine or something. I don't know. Like you just like, that's like a benefit of the job. It's like one of those cool perks. Um, I'm also the steward of uh, Big Bad Con which is a wonderful small uh, gaming convention. Uh, our last in-person event was in 2019 because the panacea, but uh, we're looking back at uh, we're looking back at, at coming back in person and we also did an online event last year which was fantastic. Uh, in fact, we were on it together. And Sean, remind me, you guys like do a Kickstarter before that con to, for, to, for like a community tickets, right or something along that line. Am I, am I remember that correctly? 
We do. We do. Every year since 2015, we've run a crowdfunding campaign um, to essentially what we realized is that there were a lot of things we really wanted in the con. Uh, we wanted private rooms for our RPG tables. We wanted a scholarship to bring folks from various marginalized entities to, to come to the con. So uh, cool. We wanted, you know, uh, vendor tables for basically anybody who wanted them. Um, and uh, all that stuff costs a lot and doesn't make a lot, right? Like, you know, I looked at the model, like most gaming conventions that are like, sell expo hall space for a ton of money. Uh, uh, you know, uh, bring in people that you can pack into like tons of people into small space. And I'm like, yeah, I'm going to do none of that. I'm going to do the opposite <laughs> of all of that. So we just needed, uh, we need, we needed the funds for it. And what I found was that people were really excited to support the con in lots of ways. And so when you pledge, you're often pledging to put your name above a door or right. you're pledging to just add more to the scholarship or That's cool. you're pledging to get, uh, some, uh, uh, assembly of PDF of games that people have contributed uh, or to play a game in an all like to play before the con in an online game. And so you're, you're paying for these things that uh, have pretty low cost to us. And that allows us to put the money in towards covering the big expenses of the scholarships and the hotel yep. costs and all that jazz. So. All right. So we haven't even started yet. But let's I know, go you ahead. already asked me a question. <laughs> I know, I just, I, yeah, Craig, wasted that's that question. one. You only get one All left. Right. Damn it. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to start. Uh, Sean, here is your question. Okay. Um, there's a couple a couple things we know for a fact. Look, one is that you have designed games. You mm -hmm. have shepherded many games. You have been part of the indie small press community for a while now and just have seen seen all of that. What is also true is that by far the biggest game out there is Dungeons and Dragons by from Watsy, right? Oh, yeah. And good 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 case a case could be made for that. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So <laughs> This may have been a debate in the industry for the past 40 years, which is with as does Dungeons and Dragons, as does the industry. So I want to know from you, Sean, do you think Dungeons and Dragons doing well, Watsi's presence growing, does that help hurt or have no effect on the rest of the industry? Wow. Thank you so much for asking me that question on an interview, Craig, and not on a tweet. Because, <laughs> man, do I not want to answer that question on Twitter, where nuance is lost. Exactly. Um, so I appreciate you asking that. Okay, so uh, I think I can answer this question from a couple different perspectives. Um, and, and I think it's really key to say that it is exactly that is a couple different perspectives. There's a couple different viewpoints that I have, not a, a truth to this because different people are going to have uh, different personal experiences and they're, and somebody else is going to say, I have lived through the exact opposite of that. And then I've had the exact opposite experience. So I don't think this is universal, but from a gamer perspective, um, like I play games, I want to see more people playing games. And from a publisher perspective, like uh, I want to make games and I want to be selling them. So as a, as a gamer, and the answer is yes on both counts, but you know, let's, let's dive into that. So as yeah. a gamer, um, I remember when the Dungeons and Dragons movie came out with Jeremy Irons and one of the Wayne's brothers <laughs> and Jeremy Irons with his blue lips and like this plot that was atrocious, even for like pulp <clears throat> fantasy, like, like even for like bad fantasy movies, it was still like a bad right. storyline. Even then, even good um, games wouldn't have made a module based on it. <laughs> <laughs> and I just remember being so Afraid. I remember being so scared that people were – because pre previously someone had said, what do you do? And I said, I play Dungeons & Dragons. And they're like, what is that? And I said, oh, we sit around and make believe and we're elves and dwarves and we have fun speaking funny voices. And some people got it, some people didn't. I, and I used – over the years, I used many different terms to describe what we were doing. Collaborative storytelling, you know, it, it, improvised theater, right? Like I, I'd call it lots of different things. But um, – but I was so afraid that next time I told somebody I played Dungeons and Dragons, be like, oh, like that movie? And I'd be like, oh, 
God, no, like, and have to backtrack. From that. And guess what? It never happened. Yeah, it's right. definitely my, it's definitely my, my gaming movie. It's definitely my favorite movie. It never happened. No one, I mean, people saw that movie. I was in a theater with hundreds of people who saw the movie. Nobody ever made that comparison. I had this fear that like the, the D and D being more public and more visible and more in popular culture was going to, was going to like somehow threaten my little nerd space me. Now that was, sure baby Sean a lot of years ago and less baby, more gray, more, more gray hair. Sean uh, can say like every time there has been a big uh, increase in awareness in Dungeons and Dragons, all that has done has made the gaming industry as a whole proliferate more. Like I, uh, I look at critical role and the, the expanse of, of actual play. I look at the number of D and D games that are being played on roll 20 and uh all of those to me seem like we're building an appetite. We're building a right. desire. Everybody, like, I don't care if anyone never finds Agon or never finds Blades in the Dark. They would be missing out. It would be very sad. But just the fact that people are have an on-ramp of D&D. And there's plenty of games I think are better on ramps than D&D. I don't think it's yep. the best game to play your first time. But it's the one that's out there. So, like, VHS and Betamax, like, D and D one, right? Yep. And I don't see a scenario in which D and D is ever not going to be uh, a huge, a huge leader <clears throat> in the industry. So I'm just stoked again as a gamer that, um, that there's so much more awareness of it. There's so many more people trying it out, and there's so many people coming in at it from different vectors. Like people don't just care about dungeon, you know, role playing from walking through their library in middle school and hearing people talking funny voices and say, "Can I?" can I join? And then being right. told you're a gnome in a sack, like I was. Um, they, they they see a stream and they go, that looks cool. I'll do that. And they try it without a lot of the baggage that I think people who've been gaming have. So Sean, but d- does it take all the air out of the room? Right. So I, it, so I, which is kind of the other discussion that happens, right. Is because, you know, because it's so big, um, you know, that they, they are, they're crowding everybody out and, you know, people aren't going to find out about a gun. I think it depends on what your goals are, right? So people, uh, people on TikTok, uh, D and D TikTok is huge. I mean, D and D in any space is huge, but like, but but D and D TikTok is the biggest, the biggest, uh, the biggest TikTok, you know, RPG TikTok out there. Uh, and if you're posting about stuff about that isn't D and D, your your follower accounts, your views are going to be one one thousandth probably of, of right. the next person. And the big question is like, how much does that matter to you? Are mm-hmm. you monetizing your experience? Is this the way that you are uh, paying your rent? Because if it does, then you should probably talk about D and D. Is this something you're just doing because you're excited about it and you want the other people who are also excited about it to uh, to engage with you? Then do it. Having one one thousandth of the audience uh is probably pretty reflective of the actual number of people out there playing Dungeons Dragons versus playing the game that you're playing. So it's not like it's out of scale. I mean maybe in some environments actual play, TikTok, et cetera, like maybe those scales are skewed, but you're definitely not like, oh, if I could only reach all the people out there who are playing you know my 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 uh my spe- the specific game that I'm super about super excited about. Like it's proportionate across all these platforms. So uh so uh, I, I think it's really about your agenda. If you need to make yeah. money in this industry, I mean, D&D is the best way to do it. And I don't fault anybody for doing that. And if you really need want to make money and you really don't want to do d and I mean, I'm in that boat. That's what I do. And I think it's, it's possible. But, yeah, it's a lot more work. And it just has to – depends on, like, what, where your, your, what your goals are, what your agenda is. Um, and they said D&D really nerfed demon summoning. Or 5e really nerfed demon summoning, which, you know, is an atrocity. I think we need to make a new 5e, 5ed, that is all about demon summoning. because Or play Blades, where demons are just a part of the world. All right, so um, I, we got to hear Mr. Harper's take on this. Right. John, do you have a follow-up for Sean? Uh I I have an observation, which is maybe a question to um which is the the chicken and egg kind of thing here i think sometimes i think the wizards uh got really lucky that a very very popular streaming 
RPG group decided that D&D was the game they were going to be playing on stream. Yep. Um, and it probably could have been anything and would have gone the way it went. I don't I don't think D&D was necessary for for that popularity to happen and the visibility of role playing that came as a result of that of Critical Role and other streams that followed. Um so in some sense, like people say, oh, 5e is like the most popular edition of Dungeons and Dragons. I, I sometimes wonder like how popular was it before right. um, our tabletop streaming really hit big. Uh, it was probably still really popular at Dungeons and Dragons, mm-hmm. but um, I wonder like if, if that was just a, a, if that was inevitable as that kind of synergy of most popular RPG and very popular popularizing force happening, kind of coming together. Or if Sean, if you think like, you know, would it have mattered or, or how much does the kind of exposure in the entertainment sector in your mind, how does that add up with like selling books as a game publisher versus like being a media kind of, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I, I wonder, you know, did, I mean, I think at the core, uh, I saw somebody in chat say that they um, the critical role started with Pathfinder. They started with Pathfinder, yeah, yeah, and then moved to D anD D. So, yeah. I, I, and I don't, I don't know if like I'm, I'm definitely not an expert in their their history, but like, you know, Pathfinder is like the second, you know, biggest mm-hmm. plot game out there um, in many times. I think it's varied. I think it's come and gone, but but um, you know, for a long time, especially when definitely when critical was starting, Pathfinder was what was you know the, the closest contender. Yeah. Um, and so it seems to me, just probability wise, just if you just like rolling a die and you're taking a chance, like a bunch of people who get together who are play a role playing game and they decide to stream, what are the odds that it's D and D? Very high because yeah. most people are who are playing role playing games are playing Dungeons and Dragons. So did critical role only was it only successful because it was proning D&D or has D&D really just benefited by accident I'm not 100% sure I can like tease that out yeah. because I think you have to ask the question of like what if what what are the odds that they would have been playing even another like even vampire or werewolf or something like that which is like still a very like, well known very well established definitely has had media representation in the past that kindred show that got canceled after one season that I love secretly not so secretly loved um uh uh you know like i I think they could have brought a lot of life to that and i really do wonder if that would have had the same kind of huge proliferation effect where everybody wants to do actual play everybody wants to start streaming everybody wants to do this stuff or if it would have been like oh this is a cool media thing that everybody's watching and i I do so i there's something about D D. There's sort of an expansiveness of, about it that, like, you can play in any of these fantasy worlds. You play in characters level 1 to 20. You have all of these feats and skills and spells and magic items. There's something about the huge expansiveness of the game that I feel like is so, like, everyone's like, I want to do my version. I want to make yep. my artifacts and I want to make my, I want to play my paladin at 20th level and I want to do, I want to do this. That um, I think if they had done another, you know, let's say they'd done Werewolf, I bet it could have been hugely successful, but I don't know if it would have had this, the same knock-on effect of getting so many other people doing it. And that's just me speculating. I don't know. I'm not sure. But but I do, I do think D&D was part of the magic. I don't know if it was all of it, but I think it was, it was part of what, what, what made it spawn so much more beyond itself. And that gets to John's chicken and the egg, right? Um, did, did, D, did Critical Role grow D and D or to D and D grow, grow critical role. Um, and it's, you know, you can go and look and see when critical role switched, uh, to D and D and their, and what happened to their viewership. Um, and is that a coincidence you know, I don't, I don't know if we would ever be able to tease it out, uh, as you put it, Sean. All right. Uh, my first question is done. Sean, you are free to now ask John a question. Nice. 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 I, I did. I did want to, I'm going to, I'm going to, Please. respond a little more yeah uh, since we have the lecture of time um <laughs> i responded primarily as a gamer or initially i just want to say as a publisher um the market is stronger than serpent yeah no doubt like like but we sold fifty thousand copies of blades in the dark right like i i and the show hasn't come out yet like i don't know how many copies we're going to sell when and that's physical copies. I I don't even. I mean, we have to add up. I think we're over. You know, probably close to a hundred thousand if we add up physical and digital. That's um, amazing. 
you know, like that, those are numbers. And, and Blaze is an incredible game. It's an, I mean, it, it's a breakthrough game in so many ways. Like, I don't think everything is is on the, the same caliber, but we had 8,500 backers for Thirsty Sword Lesbians, right? Like, we have numbers that I didn't see 10 years ago. And and I in so many different spaces. So Evil Hat has done well. I'm happy about our success. And I know that, you know, not everyone's, you know, people are all hitting, dip. not everyone's hitting those numbers, but I think everybody's numbers are up. And I think yep. everybody is people have a bigger appetite for games and they're playing more stuff. So as a publisher that we're in the golden age and D and D is doing well. Are those two causal or corollary? I don't know, but it, it, it this is the best time to be playing and making games ever. So, yeah. You know. Yeah. Uh, except for that window, that tiny window of time when the forge just started, where you could play every single indie game that came out. That was a cool time too. But like <laughs> that was, you knew that was a fleeting moment that was like, and it's gone. It was like a magical well. moment. That just like, was like, yeah, we, we managed it for about two years. I had a game group that, that that's basically what we did. We played every indie game. Uh, and uh, yeah, about about after two-ish years, it, it, we were like, okay, well, there are too many. <laughs> we can't do it. <laughs> All right. Uh, okay, so I have my question now for, for Mr. Harper. Um, I'm referencing back to the interview you did with Craig, the, the previous interview. So if anyone hasn't listened to it, it's fantastic. It's like over two hours and it's just delightful. Um, I, I had a really wonderful time listening to it myself. And one of the things you were talking about in the creation of uh, Blades in the Dark um, was this moment early on, early on when the development, the system was not, didn't have flashbacks, didn't have resistance roles, didn't, you know, a lot of these things have been built up that Bajo Baz goes to them and says like, I want you to take out this like high muckety muck amongst the unseen, amongst the unseen. And Ryan's like, yeah, sure. I'll do it. And, and all of you were like, you're going to what? And then you just said, well, so he's like, I'm going to go kill the guy and I'm gonna stab the guy in the bar. And, and your response was like, so I think what happens is you're the one in the bar who gets stabbed and you, and you die. And Ryan was like, yeah, okay. That sounds about right. And then, then you continued on to like another player was like, Oh, I'm, capture the ghost and and it it led to very cool things but in that moment before somebody said oh i have a cool idea what to do with this ghost that was like your character's dead that was one of those like bold statements and you didn't do it with a die roll you didn't Mm -hmm. do it because you ran out of hit points you didn't do it because of anything on a character sheet you did it because you said like i'm looking at the fiction and i don't know if tears existed at this point in the design but like we all know unseen or tier 4 and, you know blades crew started tier 0 right but you looked at the fiction and you went like yeah i think you're dead <laughs> and i've seen you do this many times not i think you're dead but i just like i don't need a roll for this i don't need uh i don't need to tease that anymore you told me what's going on i'm evaluating what what we've established in the fiction this seems like it's an ecological thing and a lot of times you just keep playing from that i mean that's part of the conversation but yeah uh when you make those, when you building up to those very, very bold statements, though, those statements that feel like they come out of a, a cinematic pers- perspective, right? Where you're just like, oh, yeah, this is a huge gunfight and you're shot to death, right? Like, or like you fall out the, you fall out the window, right? You know, these huge, big elements and spend this tiny little like, well, you get pushed five feet, you know? Um, I think in Blades, you've developed a system with the resistance rolls that allows you to, allows the GM to be like, I'm going to say this really bold thing and the players can say, whoa, 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 not, not sure about that. And we also have some discussion about that agon as well. But I think you fundamentally bring to your games, and this goes all the way back to like an article you had on your old website ages ago about trust as well in mm. gaming, where it was yeah. like, yeah, yeah, but the GM can't, do, the GM can't just do anything because like they still got to like, it's still got to be okay. And I, I, I wonder if you could talk about the, Sorry, I told you this took this question was gonna take a long time to ask because I, I, I want to be clear that I'm not asking like how does resistance roll work in blades, you know? <laughs> right. I wonder if you could talk about how you came to a place in your own game design and in your own GMing style of feeling comfortable making those big bold assertions without padding them too much, knowing that if it was too much, your players would say, Oh, whoa. I don't like that. And that you could roll it back or you could say, well, what could we do instead? But I think it's, there's a big difference between saying if it's okay with everybody here, I think what maybe happens is you fall off a cliff and die as like, well, 
Yeah, I think you, yeah, you fall off a cliff and die, right? Like, the, like, and just like knowing that you can say that and that it doesn't, it's not a conversation killer, that it's not a game killer. Uh, and I just wonder how you, how you got to that place in your own jamming and your own game design skills to, to not only feel comfortable doing it, but to have it have this really positive effect of like people being like, yeah, this was fucking intense. Oh, can we spy the show? <laughs> it's too late now. <laughs> Oh, well. yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Oh, well. Anyway, okay, I'm done asking right. the question. So how did uh, you get there, John? Yeah, so um, the, there's a couple components. Uh, one is um, my personal, like, tendencies as a GM do lean in that direction much more now. Uh, over time, it's gotten more in that direction. Um, but even at the beginning when I first started running games, I, I had that that inclination um, to either like cut to the chase in some cases, skip over stuff or to propose, um, kind of, uh, stark, um, consequences or, or whatever. Um, and that, so that, that's just natural for me to want to do that. Uh, but that doesn't really work unless you have a game that is giving you mechanisms to support that kind of thing, which ultimately we put into blades. Um, and there are some other games too that have that, but, uh, in the absence of explicit mechanics like that, um, it really requires the other person in that anecdote, which is Ryan, um, or whoever it is, uh, he's doing it just as much as I'm doing it in that, in that story. It's, it's a GMing technique in, from a certain point of view, but really it's the two of us doing that together. Uh, he wants me to say that in that moment, just as much as I want to say it. And, um, it's his character. And, you know, if with a different person that, that wouldn't fly, uh, in the same way there, there, there would be more of a discussion and there would be unpacking. And, um, part of the equation is that the doors always open there. Like I might say it in the sense that <laughs> it's happening. Um, it's, it's a done deal or whatever, but that, that's because I know Ryan's going to say, no, 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 I, no, I don't get stabbed. No, he doesn't. Right. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Uh, let's talk about this some more or whatever. Um, and when I, when I just say it flatly and he goes, yep, then like it, it, we've, we've sort of like skipped past that stuff. Yeah. Um, but it's still there. And I think it's really important that, that that's acknowledged that uh it's not a gming technique you could just sort of take to your game group and be like oh that sounds fun that thing john did where he just kills a character without any discussion or role i'll try that in my home group tonight like no 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 no, no. Uh, how can you go wrong um obviously that's a bad idea uh but when and and again like this this was that, that was the first scene of the first playtest session of the first uh, game of blades um, the first thing that happened, uh, <laughs> um, we, we had a little preamble. I told them a little about the world. They were in the bar and, um, the, one of Bajo's guys, uh, said like, uh, one of the unseen's right over there. Like we figured out how to like track them. Um, they, they think they can't be tracked, but we, but we can. And Ryan's like, I'll take care of him. He didn't, he didn't even ask him to kill him. He's just like, I'll, I'll go, I'll go kill this guy right now. Um, so yeah, very first thing that happened in the first scene, uh, but I had been gay. I played games with Ryan a lot at that point right. and that whole group of people. And we had had other scenes where characters got blasted, you know, to death in one, in one go. And we ignored the hit points and we ignored the attack roll and stuff. Um, and that, and that's, that's another part of the component that ultimately got into uh, some of the mechanisms and especially the kind of like GM and player facing um, techniques in that are in blades um, that have to do with, uh, kind of using your toolbox well, and I think this applies to pretty much our all RPG play. Some people really want to s believe in this idea that you, when you play a game, you use you use every single rule, and you sort of apply them in this very rote way. You always do it a certain you know way, and for some games, I think you can do that more than others. Uh, but in general, I think it behooves role players to use this great uh benefit we have for our hobby that we're not 
processing the mechanisms on a computer. Um, right. And we don't have to parse everything exactly the same every time. We can be flexible and think about how we're applying um, systems and which technique we're using. And because there's an attack role, it doesn't mean every time you swing a weapon, you make an attack role. Maybe you play that way. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think it's in Unknown Armies um, where uh, John Tynes, or, or maybe it's Greg, I forget which wrote that section, but um, they talk about like your skill rating, you know, you, I've, you've got your like 38% in, in pistols or whatever. And that doesn't mean when you go to the range and you start shooting at your paper target, you hit it 38% of the time. That's ridiculous. Um, you probably hit it every time. Uh, it's it's 38% under duress or or when someone else is shooting back or yeah. you, you kind of decide as a GM and, and player um, what what's triggering that role. And a, a good RPG will tell you like this, this is how you know when you're triggering a role. Mm -hmm. um, you'll have a sense of it uh, or, or, or it'll be very specific, but you still have to make those judgment calls. And yep. um, that moment with Ryan's character being killed, it, it, again, we had our shorthand that collapsed it down into just his action and my re response. Um, but what's really happening there is uh, that again, that judgment where I'm thinking, okay, is, yeah. is this a role? Does he even get to roll to try to kill this guy? Or like, do I need him to test something to see if this guy notices it? No, he, of course he notices him. Like this is the master assassin for the end scene. Um, some punk off the street isn't going to get the drop on him. Right. Yep. There's no way Ryan's character isn't in the fictional position to achieve the thing he's mm -hmm. trying to do. It's, it's kind of like he said, I stick my arm in the bucket of molten lead and grab the thing and pull it out and you roll, don't for go, it. roll for it. You go, uh, you melts your arm off. Like, I don't know what to say. Oh, um, there, there's not a roll for that. I take uh, a sledgehammer to a tower. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Uh, yeah. So it's, it, it, it is, it's the player trust component. Yeah. Um, and then the, uh, toolbox component and through, through play, I, I think, um, it's a fun process. I, it, every time I play a new game or play with a new group, uh, those first few sessions and th throughout the campaign usually um, is that fun process of discovery. Like, how are we going to implement the system? When do we make this type of role? When do we use this type of role? When do we use a long-term project? When do we, you know? Yeah. Um, and that's that's always really fun. And it gives each game its own, each uh, you know game series its own texture and its own feel because um, we are we're assuming the trust thing right that's the foundational right, yeah. component but once that's in place then you can have fun with exploring just exactly how you want to play that play the instrument yeah and you figure it figure it out at the table right and you extend that social contract out um so that makes sense all right john you're up buddy uh who do i want to who's your first? target <laughs> i think I think I will ask you, since you have not been asked yet, Greg. Uh, okay. So as the best interviewer in the business. <laughs> um, <laughs> you're, you're very good. You're very good. I love I, this I, question, John. <laughs> <laughs> this, is how, this is how this got started. Uh, uh, people in chat, uh, I, 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 when I reached out to Greg. Um, I, my, my question is... Um, how do you prepare? Uh, you, you seem very prepared uh, when you do interviews. You seem like you've done research. You've, you know your, the subject of your interview. Um, your questions are, are prepared ahead of time and all that. Some of that stuff's obvious, but I wonder if you could unpack a little bit what your process is there, because I feel like um, most of the people listening probably aren't interviewers, but they probably are uh, tabletop gamers. And I, I bet in, in your prep, I'm, I'm suspecting that uh there's something to, to take away there uh, for for gms or whatever uh, so i was curious just kind of what your general process of prep for interviews was yeah it uh it, it, it's and i'm going to tie it to gming uh in a second john uh, i think you would be shocked how minimal my prep is um and part of it is is that i hand select my guests right so i'm not in a situation where they say craig you need to interview this person right i i find people that i that i think would be interesting to talk about my angle's different right because i john you came on and we didn't just sit there and say you know how do you play blades how do you play a god right we talked about like how do you make shit 
Um, and, yeah. you know, and that's the style of what I do is I, I, I talk to people about how they make games. Um, so I handpick them. Obviously, I want to be familiar with their body of work. Um, but I don't want to turn it into an Apple Klein book where we just go, then this happened, then this happened, then this happened, right? But the biggest thing for me, John, is learning to ask questions that are a little provocative, um, but nothing too nutty. But the biggest part is after the answer. And, and that's listening to the answer because that's the gold. And 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 so often, I'll, and part of what made me want to do the podcast and interview on the podcast, I would get so pissed listening to, and they like the guy would say, "Okay, well, can you tell me about how this came about?" And the the designer would say, "Yeah, well, I started off with these dice, and then I went this, and this." Okay, can you tell me about the setting? And it's like, son of a bitch, dude! Like, <laughs> why are you not well, asking about like, yeah, like, come on, like he just said something really interesting. Um, so I don't know where my interviews are going to go. Um, so you, you've gotten a call sheet for me, John. It is it's Spartan, right? It's just like, here's like the high level shit I want to talk about. And then as part of the prep of my interview, when I do the pre the pre show, I say, look, I don't know where this is going to go. Um, and, and if we take a hard right turn that don't you worry about that guest. You just talk. Right. I'm the host. It's my job. If you get boring to pull you back in again. So so don't edit. Let's let's just chat. And then what ends up happening for whatever reason, whether it's how I approach things or whatever. But what ends up happening is it just ends up being me and John talking about games. And that turns into interesting stuff. So how does this tie to gaming, John? Listen, 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 listen. And as a GM, it works the exact same way. The players are telling you, right? The, the guest is telling me what they want to talk about. The guest is telling me, Craig, nobody's ever asked me this before by, by how they're answering my questions. As a GM, you can do the same thing. And th that's like, that's where the gold is. That's where the gold is. I was, I was hoping that was going to be your answer. My suspicion was that you didn't do tons and tons of prep, um, even though it looks that way. And I think that's something that, that GMs often stress about um, or compare themselves to someone else and, and think, oh, they must do so much prep because yeah. it's so smooth and so it seems so polished. So I better do that too. And um, most of that stuff you don't even end up using um, because like yeah. you said, if you're, if you're listening and responding genuinely, yeah. you're going to follow the threads rather than like go back to your notes and make sure you hit all, all the little, all the, uh, every, every box, checkbox. I mean, that, that's what a lot of, you know, we're listening, listening to your, my prep for this was listening to your interview that you had put, you, you tweeted. And I was like, this sounds like one of those conversations that you have after a game late at night at a con. And afterward you go, damn, we should have recorded this. Right. Like you have, the, you have one of those like really great, like, Oh yeah, man. We both, we all said these smart things. Uh, <laughs> I wish I'd taken some notes. I wish I'd recorded it, or I wish I'd turned this into a podcast episode. When I ages ago had a podcast, I would often find that we would be like, "Cool, that was the podcast. That's a wrap. We hit stop recording, and then we'd have this great conversation." <laughs> after it was like, I was like, "Damn!" I, I almost the part I was like, "Cool, we we finished recording," and like, like, yeah. click. But I, I didn't, which I kind of wish I had. But, but you have to set the stage for the guests that way, right? So in my, in my show notes that I send off beforehand, in my pre-interview, I say, the sooner this devolves into you and me talking about games, the better off this would be. Um, I, and I tell them, we'll plug the shit out of your stuff. We'll, we'll talk about it. We'll make sure everybody knows where to get it. But I, I don't want to know what you make. I want to know how you make it. Um, and that's also, I think, what has allowed me to get some big names on the show. Um, I've, I've got... Uh, like 20 unreleased shows and there's some pretty cool people on there some pretty cool interviews on there and i think it's because people recognize it's not going to be the 10th podcast where they come on and just spit out the standard stuff right they're actually going to talk about interesting stuff and the biggest compliment i get and i i'm very lucky because i get it a good bit is after afterwards they're like that, that was fun or like like you you've asked me stuff nobody's ever asked me um or even sometimes you'll hear it in the interview they'll like go oh i've not heard that one before that's a good question and that that's me on cloud nine right you can't see my face <laughs> on the podcast I'm like yeah so <laughs> all right so mine for john now you know everybody's gotten a question um john i can go 
to a store. I can go to Evil Hat's website and I can see all of your ideas that have been published, right? All of these things and all of those ideas started off with an idea and then they turned into something, turned into something. And now they're a book. Now they're a PDF. Now they're things that people can buy and play. I imagine that as a fraction of your ideas that we actually get to get to play, right? That we get to interact with. So that means that there's this huge dumpster somewhere <laughs> with all the ideas that not only didn't make it to publish, but, but you threw away, right? So it's not like, oh, I'm going to save that for later, right? I might use that. I might use that. I would imagine there's a dumpster of, of <laughs> full of stuff that you threw away and you're like, yeah, this is garbage. So the question is, what do they have in common? Hmm. Hmm. Interesting yeah, which question. Which way are you asking that question? Is it yeah. what? Do, what's the commonality of what's kept, or what's the commonality of what's tossed? No, I don't care about what's kept. I want to know of the stuff that got thrown away. If I were to go dive into that dumpster and pull that all out and look at it, well, I'd like, oh, this make you know, I, what's what 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 commonality would I see in your discarded ideas? <clears throat> hmm. Um. I have to think about that. Uh, I think. I can get to it. Um, one, well, I, it, it it might be the inverse of of what's kept, possibly. Um, okay. Which is generally what's what's kept is either something that uh, is just a really tough nut to crack that I know I'm just going to work on for a long time and keep trying it, um, and not willing to let it go because it's i don't think it's bad i just think it's too hard to do um so in that in that sense there's um things that aren't discarded that maybe could be discarded because i i might not ever really get to it and really finish right. it um but the things that really are like genuinely just i ha ha probably have forgotten they ever existed or i ever even started them um is probably because they never got played um, interesting generally if i'm serious about something i'll try to get it to a table like really really early um and if that doesn't happen and it just stays a, as a you know google doc or or even a, a layout or something and i i don't play it it will just gradually just fade away it just um, dies on the vine yeah and sometimes you know i i don't truly toss anything like i i have all that stuff um it's tucked away in folders um and every now and then when i'm browsing through looking for something i'll see a folder name and go what is that uh <laughs> and open it and like oh i made a character sheet for this what is this oh okay i i, I we never we never played it and i completely forgot about it um so that's definitely a factor uh yeah. not not playing um and i think one of the other common things would be uh a lot of them are probably reactions to something that was happening at the time like i saw someone else's work maybe in a video game or a board game or, or, an, or an rpg and went no 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 that's not how you do that <laughs> that's not how you do that there's another there's another way to do that or, yeah. or maybe not maybe not that's not how you do it but like that's not how i would do it right uh so I went in and like sketched it out real quick. Like, uh, and then sometimes uh, satisfaction is like a real enemy there too, where I go, oh, okay, yep, that's how you do that. Well, this isn't interesting anymore. I'll, uh, whatever, I'll move on to something else. <laughs> um, so that's, that's part of it too. Uh, things that are very simple and get solved really quickly, I, I might lose interest in. Um, but yeah, I think, I, I think my answer is, is play. And Sh Sean yeah. definitely knows this. Uh, enough to, to like when when things are flagging and when i'm like not working and dragging my feet on something he's always like hey, we should play this let's let's, <laughs> let's 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 get a group together let's let's play I, I was, sean I, is a puppet master <laughs> I did, I, well it's just i mean it's you know it i i saw it Agon is the you know the, the game that John and I designed. Like I, I've worked with John a lot on a lot of a lot of projects, but Agon is the one where I think we were the most intimate because we were working on it together. And it was just this thing where, I, and it wasn't just John. I mean, this is I think true, maybe not true for everybody, but it certainly applied to me as well. And it felt it felt very universal that we'd be talking about the rules, and it just felt like we were kind of like it's like 
it's hard to know how much traction you're getting. Like you're like, well, we could change this, we could change that. And until you take it to the table, you just like don't really know what the effect on play is. And so if you keep making it changes and changes and changes and changes without putting them into play, you're not you're not getting any of that feedback. You're not getting any of that like I tried this, did it work? I tried that, didn't work. And not and and the lack of that feedback, the lack of that at the table feedback also just sucks away energy. It just sucks away like the excitement for it. It's that yeah. play that is for me that it that is like so delightful. And I, I feel like one of the things I like, one of the things I feel very strong about is like I I I, I feel very good about knowing like what is playable. Like I can mm-hmm. see something and be like, cool, that's something fun for people to jump onto. And I can see something else and be like, I don't know what to like, how do you play with that? And um, yeah, it's, it's, it, there were lots of times where we were just like, well, let's find out if this is playable. And let's yeah. play a session. And that's what got the, us going. And that's what got us, you know, we have these like low, 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 rapid, 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 yeah. like, you, know, low, you know, because, yep. and it very much, very often corresponded to our play. So yeah, I guess in a sense, it's a it's a similar answer to what you just answered uh, with your question, Craig. Like it's it is that process of listening, yep. you know, doing something and, and reacting to it as opposed yep. to just sitting alone and like trying to to suss it out. Um, that back and forth um, action and reaction is is really the heart of for me and and, and Sean too, I guess. Um, uh, it really like makes the engine run. Um, yeah. and, and I, I, I think what Sean, what you just said is, is a factor too. I've gotten better over the years of kind of knowing what's gonna hit or like, okay. A, am I going to enjoy working on it? B, is it going to have an audience? I, like mm-hmm. I make stuff to be played, not just to sort of make it. Um, and, uh, so some of those abandoned things probably have those qualities too, where once yeah. I kind of get enough of it out of my head, I can look at it and go, nah, that's no one's going to play that. Or this is not enough of a, the pitch isn't strong enough to make someone interested enough to look at it. Um, it needs a better name. It needs a better graphic. It needs a cooler, uh, you know, pitch sentence or something. Um, so someone will play it. And uh, over the years, I think my instincts have gotten a lot better for that. So yeah, I have fewer cases of, of doing something and then not and then kind of discarding it because i don't even get that far with it i just kind of like no like nah that's not going to work so move move on but i at the same time i do almost always have i don't know around a dozen ish um games projects you know running um including the one that i'm like supposed to be doing for sean (laughs) Um, (laughs) sometimes it gets top priority um sometimes uh, but, uh, that's, I, I, I like to work that way in general, I'm kind of like bouncing back and forth, do a little bit of here, do a little bit there. Um, and yeah, some of those over time are going to be, end up in that discarded pile too. But, uh, so a couple things are the process. Yeah. A couple things I'm hearing that I think is interesting there, John one, I, I love the idea that like, there's an instinct for playability, right? Not getting lost in the details. We can fix this. We can adjust that. We can roll t- D tens instead of D sixes. Is this at its heart playable to have an instinct for that? The other thing I was hearing too, is a sense of momentum and excitement and how important that is. Yeah. That's definitely a factor. Um, at least in, in development, like there's always going to be that point where, it, it's finished and now it needs to be like produced as a product and that's always going to be just like okay we got to check every box and like do the thing and mo- the m- momentum there is not a, really a factor you just have to do all the stuff to get it the book ready yeah um but in development yeah it definitely ebbs and flows and like sean was saying like um it, there'll be rapid iteration and then like a period where it's kind of not happening and um, that's just very natural. Uh, and that's another reason why having multiple projects is good because oh, right. there is, especially now that it's like a full-time thing for me, it, it's, it's like, uh, my future, you know, livelihood is one of those dozen things that is in the background. Like that matters. I, I, I need to have yeah. the next thing. Uh, it, I, it, finishing this thing right in front of me is important, but also like, I can't, not have something later (laughs) (laughs) so uh it it's all it's all work and and the the other thing that that uh sean knows very well is very often when i'm working on something else i'll solve the problem in the other game 
um, because I've gotten out of that mindset where I was stuck. And uh, when I'm working over here, I'll realize partway through, like, wait, I'm actually fixed. This is for that other one. <laughs> you just I need this. I need to move this over there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, so. and John, you've also, it's great. You were mentioning like, you know, resolution systems don't, don't matter that much. Like John, you've, you've like several times posited the, okay, if we don't know how this resolution system is going to go here, we flip a coin. Yeah. It doesn't matter. Later on, we'll figure out what the right. dice mechanics are. But right now, I know moment of uncertainty, what leads up to it, what comes out of it. And I just want to get through that moment of uncertainty yeah. quickly for the play test and play design. And then yeah. later on, we can figure out how, how to do that. So I think also John has learned some really good shortcuts for things that might be a blockade in another game where you're like, oh, I got to get my die pool mechanic working just perfectly right. so that like – it's just the right amount of tension. And it's like, well, yeah, maybe that is the thing you need to do, but you would be better able to do that if you had the full breadth of the game and you exactly. can't get the full breadth of the game. If you keep starting over, you're like, <laughs> right. I do move one. Oh, that didn't work. Okay. I do move one again. And John's like, let's do yeah. move one. Okay. Whether it works or not, we're going to go to move two. I mean, and you often try, I think you often like press through um, not worrying too much about a lot of the, the, the filling in details until you've got a better holistic sense of it. And I know yeah. that that's back and forth. Sometimes it's top yeah. down, sometimes it's bottom up, but that's that, that trick of being able to like not worry about having everything perfect. I think is really, I, I think that it's something I've seen in your design a lot as you've, you've moved forward and I think it lets you like reach to higher heights. But then, yeah, I otherwise. think it's really important. Uh, <laughs> It, 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 in general with any kind of design uh, graphics or, or game or whatever, um, not getting bogged down when you're stuck uh, on a particular detail and just kind of letting it, letting it be imperfect uh, or not even exist and just move on. Um, because may, you ultimately want to make those very bespoke things that are just right for what you're trying to do. But if you haven't seen it, happen like it is it fun to pretend to be this type of character in this situation right. doing this type of stuff and we maybe we flipped a coin for some stuff and that wasn't interesting as a mechanic but is it interesting to do this at all mm -hmm. uh and if you can find that out and oh it is like we're still we're very engaged in imagining that we're doing these fictional things it it deserves to have a cool bespoke mechanic made for it right. because that was cool we all had fun yep pretending that um it kind of has to justify itself and i know some people are they work well the other way they they can't they're not happy until they have their really pretty mechanic and then they go okay what can i use this in what what can, where can i apply this that works too uh mm -hmm. but um for me it, it it again it's always that like i know ultimately this pitch needs to hit well um that's what's going to make people bother to pick it up and play it yeah. It maybe it's something that's for sale and that's good for for marketing and for selling it. Maybe it's a free thing. Either way, it you you, you want people to play it. I want people right. to play it. So yep. um yeah, that that pretending to be that thing doing that doing that stuff, that's got to be really strong um and kind of earn its earn its place in the <laughs> the mechanical, you know, uh, merry-go-round of of work process <laughs> to, <laughs> to get to save itself from the dumpster mm -hmm. all right so john i think it is your turn to ask sean his second question if you're an athlete you know the greatest motivator of all is the fear of letting your teammates down after all, a team is only as good as its weakest link. So you owe it to those wearing the same jersey as you to be your best every time you step on the field. That's why there's no vape in team. When you vape, you can expose your lungs to toxic chemicals that can damage your lungs. If you're a step behind, the team's a step behind. Brought to you by The Real Cost and the FDA. There are specific skills we use when we play a role-playing game. The better we are, the more fun it is for everyone at the table. Karen Twelves and Friends wrote the second edition of Improv for Gamers, so you can level up your play. The book helps you strengthen your storytelling skills, craft more exciting and multifaceted player characters and NPCs, and it also helps you know when and how to end a scene or share the spotlight with other players. 
The new edition for Improv for Gamers contains over a dozen new exercises, tips from experienced players, storytellers, and GMs, and advice for adapting the lessons for online play, accessibility, and your specific game and group. Evil Hat Productions is crowdfunding this right now on GameFound. I backed at the $25 level, and I'm getting the hardcover book, the PDF, and I'm also getting a chance to fund a community copy for Itch. The digital pledge is only $15. So join me and take your table to a new level of fun. The campaign ends on May 5th, so click on the link in the show notes. All right. Uh, so, Sean, you uh, have been a developmental editor on games, Blades in the Dark and others. Um, I suspect that a lot of or most of the uh, current or potential game makers that are listening to this don't have developmental editors uh, on their projects. Um so I was wondering if you would maybe give a like a brief summary of what that is and then maybe talk about uh, how that process has been for you, um, you know, it, both in, in an f- official capacity with, with Evil Hat and also just like personally, uh, like, you know, your, um, your process there and, and kind of like um, how you got get, get into uh, the process on a game and, and kind of what you do as a, as a development project. Yeah. Oh, that's it. Thanks. Thanks for asking. That's a good, that's a, that's a fun question to explore. Um, so yeah, let's talk a little bit about what that means. Cause that's a title that like I've given, I don't know if it's accurate, like it, all, all titles in game design totally are made up. just made up <laughs> yeah. creative director, producer, developer. <laughs> sometimes they're synonymous with each other. Sometimes <laughs> they mean somebody uses the same term two different for totally different things. So what, what I will say, what I mean by developmental editor is that I look at a game. I often like to look at a game when it's still pretty rough. Um, I do this a lot with pitches that get sent to evil hat. People say like, Hey, you want to publish my game? I've got this game. It's, you know, here it is. And it's in this very, it's in this, like I've made it, but it's not in its final form uh, at all uh, stage. And I don't just mean like layout and art. I mean, like the game itself is still, it's playable right now, but it's not, it's clearly not worked out. And so I often look at these games that are in that like, 50 75 percent complete space and i start sort of parsing through like i immediately look at a plate uh, at a character sheet like that's the very first thing i do because i'm like what am i going to see as a player like can i already take my existing knowledge of forge in the dark or pbta or d20 or fade or whatever game system and apply it here can i figure out what's going on so what's like what's like the learning curve for me not really knowing anything about your game because a lot of players it's literally the only thing that I'm ever going to see is a character sheet. So I like, I describe mm-hmm. a character sheet and I'm like, how intuitive is this? How much? And then I start going like, how much fun will this be? Uh, <laughs> do I want to take this move? Do I want to do this ability? Does this seem really convoluted? Does this seem like it'd be difficult to bring into play? Um, and then, uh, and then the big follow-up is like the big follow-up, which is where I think I give like value to the creator is when I start asking how, like, how is this going to go from here to here to here? Because I think that, most of the time when somebody is first writing a game, they are not writing it the way you would describe it to someone sitting at a table. Hmm. They're writing it as they're developing it. And so right. they're, what needs to come first, what needs to come second, it's all in a jumble because it's how it, they came to it. Just like John was saying, he's working on one game and he goes, oh, oh I had an idea. And he'll drop back and sell the game. But where he drops it, the first time may not be the right the right spot for it and it also may be something he put in months ago and changed and didn't realize that something else uh you know was you know had, had changed since then and so a lot of times i'm constantly like how does how do we go from step one to step two how do we go from step two to step three and like is that going to be fun is that going to be an, an exciting thing to do and often i'll look at a move and i'll be like i don't get it <laughs> and so it's like what do you mean and i'm just like do I roll? Do I roll dice? Do does the GM decide? Like a lot of times, it comes down to like, how do we decide what happens next? Is is the move telling me? Is it up to the GM to describe? Uh, is it up to 
uh, the, the the player describe okay. is it up to sort of some some sort of other like resolution mechanism and there's no wrong answer but I need to know the answer I need what? to know like how how we figure out what we do next because if it's oh you'll figure out a play I think there's you know there's absolutely room for that but you still need to coach people through it I mean Blades yeah. has a whole chapter on this is a conversation which you know John got inspiration from. From Vincent saying, "Oh yeah, yeah, it's a game, is a conversation," <laughs> you know, flippantly, <laughs> right? Uh, but and, and I mean, many other many other people have, have said it as well. Uh, uh, but like, you still need to know, like, it's a structural conversation. It's a conversation where we care about these things and those things, and we don't care about these other things. It's a conversation where everybody has a, a role that they play. And so I'm often just at, just just going through and like you know, I said earlier, like I feel like one of my strengths is like identifying playability is looking through and like imagining like what would this be like at the table and like how are we going to make it work and 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 is it going to be fun you know because there's really there's really cool mechanics that are super neat and 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 and, and like uh I, th- I feel like they're like very nuanced as to what they do but in play you're just like oh my god like uh the exalted the exalted second edition um, combat mechanic where every time you did something it like had a had a speed. So if I like do an action, it only takes three ticks, then I get to go in three ticks. But if I did an action it takes five, I don't get to go tell another I don't know what the quite terminology is. Like like I looked at that and I was like, that sounds super, super cool, right? That's like neat. And then I was like, oh, you're never ever gonna do anything other than the shortest things you can because getting to do stuff is the most interesting part of the game. Yep. So if I do stuff that happens more frequently, I get to play more. So like mechanically that seemed very cool but in play and not to say that, that, that people don't love that system I, I think Exalted did some fun stuff with it but I, I immediately was like hmm as right. soon as I hit play right um, so real quick Sean um, I mean obviously that's got to be a huge resource for somebody like John right is to have somebody who can be outside of the development process that can parse things out that can ask the questions that that maybe the dev hadn't asked themselves right but what what I need to know is where the hell did you pick this up? Like you didn't go to school for this, right? You didn't. You weren't born this way. So where did where did the instinct come from? How did you? How are you good at this? Uh, you know, it's funny. I feel like I feel like in some ways, John and I have taken kind of differing paths, right? You know, it uh, when John sees a mechanic that he's like, oh, I could do this another way. He goes and like designs it, right? <laughs> Which is amazing. I mean, that that is by far the more impressive of these two <laughs> options, right? Like, oh, I didn't like this thing, so I just made a new one, and it's beautiful, and it's elegant, and, like, everybody wants to play it. That is the thing you should aspire to do. Well, that is the thing that I am I, I have great, you know, great admiration and uh, for. Uh, but another thing you could do <laughs> is you could just kvetch about it. You know, you could go to your home table and be like, nah. I'm just going to have, and I think this is what m- many people do. I'm going to house rule that like this, this, this rule is boring and broken and I didn't like it. And I mean, and ultimately like those are both game design. Mm-hmm. They're just game design, different levels. They're game design on like leading towards publication or leading towards the thing you can share with people outside of your own. I, I, I say publication in a very broad sense, like publication being anything shared with any audience, right? So publishing it just to your local group, your local group of friends, publishing it to, you know, free on the internet, publishing it in a book that you, you know, are selling. Um, but, you know, it just depends on like who the audience for that is. And whereas John has like the visual, uh, understands visual language and, 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 the, and, the, and the, like the writing skills of rules and whatnot, uh, I'm lazier <laughs> in that regard. And just like, nah, I'm just a put some notes in here, but those same notes that are like not going to produce a game are very useful to the person who's producing it. I right. are very useful to the person who's producing the game. Like this doesn't make sense anymore. Um, that, you know, let, let's, let's, uh, what, what if we, uh, merge this to this? Um, I think one of my, in the same notion, I mean, this is how we did like signed Agon together. I think, uh, Agon first edition and for a long time, second edition, the uh, the way you got home was like there was a return home track. And at one point I was just like, I want some meat on that bone. I want like something specific. And like, 
we and then we bounced around a bunch of ideas and eventually what came out of that was like the vault of heaven and it wasn't that i had this brilliant idea for the vault of heaven it was that i was like not good enough like let's let's make it more personal let's make it let's yeah. tie it to a god how are we gonna do that ah stars oh now we can divine wrath all that stuff came from you know both of our contributions but um uh yeah so i mean play lots of sorry i don't know if i had to play lots of games have strong opinions about them <laughs> Yeah. And, and and really look for moments of friction in play where where players and are just like, uh, like I thought I did. Like John, your earlier example of I have a thirty eight percent skill in my pistol, and when and and uh, an unknown army is calling out like you don't roll if there isn't a, a you're under duress. That exact scenario is one that I feel like I've hit so many times in my gaming career where someone's like, I'm this super badass ninja. I'm gonna climb over the wall. Make us make a climb roll. You failed. You fell on the ground and took one d six damage. And you're like, how did I not? What kind of super badass ninja am I? <laughs> why? Why did I roll for that? Why did I fail that? Why did Why did failure mean I didn't succeed? Like, there's so many ways you could do that. You could just say, "Quit climb over the wall." We we Sorry. we played we play tested uh, what was called D and D next uh, back then. Oh, I remember um, that. Yeah, and uh, it it had some issues, and it's it was very <laughs> very very early. They were trying stuff that that mm-hmm. all got all got d- deleted um but uh the the catchphrase from that session that i always take with me is someone said uh we suck at everything we're good at <laughs> um, and, <laughs> and that's yeah. that's always stayed in my brain because it's just like yeah it it it, it always comes up in games yeah. where you just hit that one mechanic where you're like i, I don't want to roll dice to get to play the game <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I don't. I don't want to. I don't. I also don't want the outcome of the dice rolls to, to tell me what kind of character I'm playing. Right. Some games. That's a great are, way to put it. Some games are like that, where like you don't. You're, you're meant to not know. But yeah. if you are going with a strong high concept, um, I want to be able to deliver on that concept. And yeah. and if if the dice tell me no, you're not that cool character you thought you were. Yeah. That's a bummer. It's it's why you will probably see every game that I've ever done developmental editing has some section somewhere in it where it goes. If you fail, it's not because you're not awesome. It's because circumstances can drive against you. Indiana Jones doesn't make, he doesn't, when he swings across the snake pit, it's not that he doesn't make it. It's that there's dude with spears on the other side of it, right? right? He made the, he failed the athletics check. And the way we describe that is you swing across, you're just about to do it. And then guys with spears pop out and you go, oh crap. And you have to drop into the pit because it's the only thing he's that or get speed, right? And the, you know, it's it. There's lots of ways to say it, but I'm always trying to advocate for player agency in the sense of like, don't deprive me of what is core to my character. Um, and I don't think all games need that. Some games really, you need to be able to say like, look, playing Band of Blades, your character might just die like that. Right. You know, your characters might get. Uh, in some games, your characters are meant to have a lot more experience versus agency. Like you're meant to like be really affected in weird ways, and you shouldn't have control over it. But um, but I want to find that balance for what feels right for the game. Like, what was the game need in that, in that regard? Something else that I, I've noticed um, working with you in that capacity, uh, Sean, is um, this. Uh, you have a, a skill for sort of, I don't know what to call it, like cross-referencing, um, where I, I'll be, you know, working away, working away, and on this, on this part over here, um, and and solve it or whatever like yeah okay we got it and i show it to you and you're like great that invalidates this and that makes this other thing weird now and remember that thing you wrote a year ago that we can't we can't use that now because this doesn't. and i'm like oh wait yeah right okay <laughs> and there's, it feels like you just have that web of connections um, a beautiful mind <laughs> yeah kind, yeah kind of um, uh, thank you uh, I do remember a rule that said when you encounter a, uh, a, a supernatural horror, uh, you take 10 stress and minus resistance roll. Like that was just this weird thing that was in Blades for a long time, honestly. Yeah. And it wasn't that it was the rule. It was that it was just like a vestige of something right. beyond, right? Like it was yeah. like, yeah, it's going to really stress you out, right? Uh, <laughs> and and like that just isn't a thing, right? Like there's no there's no part of Blades to say you take stress now. It, it might say you when you encounter a ghost, you freeze or run and you have to resist if you don't want to do that. I mean, that's what that sort of turned into. Yep. But it isn't just like, you, you know, you take, uh, yeah, you, you take stress. And um, yeah, and that's uh, uh, that worked in some iteration, right? That that worked at a, at a time. Right. Um, so, yeah, I think I, I try. Hmm. 
Thank you. That's a very kind thing to say. I don't know <laughs> if I'm about like where, where it goes from, but I do think being cognizant of how all the pieces um, interact is really is really critical to like knowing that like we're going to play a game session that's going to feel like it's the same game throughout. It's not going to feel yeah. like oh wait we we're playing this game. Um, I have played a game. I don't want to besmirch anybody game in particular, but I played a game where one side of the character sheet had all these really cool like narrative questions, and then I flipped over the other side of the character sheet, and it looked like it was like like a 1980s like Battletech MechWarrior oh, God. variant game. And I was like, how do we get there? How do, yeah. how, do we, how do we go from one game, like this is like two games on different sides of the character sheet, which is kind of a neat idea, except that it wasn't trying to be that. Like if it was right. a different, like it, that could have been cool. Um, yeah, and I just think, you know, uh, and I mean, that's that's also the, like, you look at the number of play tests that John did with play. It's like, I was certainly part of it, but I wasn't there the whole way. I mean, John, you had at least 25 versions of Blades, right? Wow. At, at least. And those yeah. are just like the official, like actually released. I'm sure there's more micro versions, right? Like John played the hell out of it. He released it very early. Um, and, and there was a very avid group on Google plus that was all playing the hell out of it. And like, all of that stuff is the same thing too. So if you're going, well, how do I get that? Where is the skills to do that? Like, ultimately, I, the 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 signal to noise ratio may vary. Like, I might say something that's complete garbage and useless, and that that, that like I am still very capable of, of of sending noise, right? I can be like, I don't like this. You should do this instead, which might be useless information, um, and or or not useless, but it may not help you achieve right. goal. And and when you leave things out to play test and you put them out there like that ratio is always kind of bouncing around sometimes you get really insightful comments sometimes you just get stuff that like you know maybe they didn't like it but they're trying to play a different game that you're designing you know whatever the, the issue is but i think you get similar kind of we did x and then we got y result and that didn't make any sense or we did x and then we did y but we couldn't do z because of you know this that, the other. so yeah i i think that's true there is there is if you don't have a dedicated developmental editor on your project, a lot of playtesting can get to some of those things um, with more time and a lot more noise. Um, but I, I also think that there's another, uh, there are other components to that role in addition to that. Um, mm -hmm. um, one, you know, keeping your eye on the ultimate goal, um, kind of being the, the, the razor by which things are, are passing, you know, yeah. Um, like now that's not what we're trying to do. Are we trying to do that now? Are we get, are we adding that to the, what we're trying yeah. to achieve is, is this new information? Like, wait, no, you're right. We're, we, we're not <laughs> trying to do that. Let's stay the course. Um, and that the kind of stuff can be very freeing for, mm. and that's how I feel about it as a designer. Like if I know in some sense, like I don't have to always care about that and someone else is really caring about that. I can take more risks. I can try stuff. Um, because I know someone's going to be like, Hmm, no, that, we're, that we need to update our, our spec or not do that. Yeah. Um, and if I'm not worried about that, I can maybe, you know, take chances uh, and, and be supported too. I think that's another yeah. component here, uh, Sean, that it is definitely in your skill set um, as a human being, <laughs> um, but also uh, you. in your, in your professional role, like having, having moral support and like yeah. having that like sense that I'm someone is, is like, pushing the boat with me you know yeah. uh is is like a huge huge component too well i i'm extremely fortunate that i have a day job that pays my bills and mm -hmm. that i have i and that also gives me a lot of flexibility in my time that allows me to dedicate a lot of time to to evil hat there's there's times when like somebody will submit a game to us and i'm just like no nah, it's not an evil hat game right and i just say thanks so much for submitting it um you know uh uh we're not a good, we're not a good fit, but you know, best of luck. And I give a really, really, really and that, that happens pretty often. Um, but there's other times where I'm like, do you want me to give you my feedback on it? And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, okay. And I said like, <laughs> I've sent 25 page documents back to people. of being like, wow, here's all my stuff. And it's completely, a, you know, it's, it's, it's not a, uh, I mean, I don't think it's a way, like I value it because I am interested in what they're doing yep. and I, and I can, I think the game has a potential, I has a feature, but I don't know that it's going to come to, you know, evil. I don't know that mm -hmm. like, we're going to publish it. It's not something that like, I charge for. And it really varies. I mean, sometimes it's based on my time available. Sometimes it's based on how right. much it catches me, but you know, I'm looking at a game right now that I've already done 
uh, play tested with twice. I'm going to go into my third round of play testing before even being ready to pitch it, be, <laughs> before being ready for Evil Hat to sign on to it. There's still a possibility that the game will go a different direction, and that would be fine. Yeah. Uh, but I saw it, and I was excited about it, and I was like, I want this to work. It doesn't, but I'm going to I'm gonna, I'm gonna hope. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and get you there. And John's games are so like your 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 design senses are so refined that I'm never in that place. Like I'm never like I'm going to try and help you get this this thing that isn't working to a state. But but we do more like refining and right. uh, and and that's fun too. I mean it's it's really uh, if, if Nav, Navi's I think in chat right now and she she has received one of those one of those twenty k <laughs> <laughs> feedback. So we played we played five episodes of Quarter Blades and had a blast. And I was just like, and I have so many thoughts. <laughs> Well, it's and this kind of ties to a lot of what we've already been talking about. Like, it, there's this all the way back to the D and D question. So, uh, you know, I've got a full time job too, Sean. Right? I've got a job that pays my bills. Um, Lord knows, third floor wars would never pay a bill, let alone bills. <laughs> um, but it frees me up, right? So it frees me up. It frees you up, Sean, to say I'm going to spend you know time play testing this game that I may never pitch to Evil Hat. Because you have that freedom to do that. You don't have the pressure of the of the power bill being a result of you pitching this game to, to Evil Hat. Yeah. And that's that's exciting. And it's a little bit different tying to what you said, John, which is, yeah, I can't fuck around much. Like, I need to make a game. Because <laughs> food's good. I like food. <laughs> um, not, and, nice and that's rent, interesting. Pay rent, yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, you know, I don't play D&D &D on my, like, I run lots of games on my stream. None of them are D&D, &D, and I have that freedom, right? Because right. I don't depend on revenue from my stream to pay a bill. Um, same thing with, you know, I have never had anybody that's involved with D&D &D really. Oh, well, I've got two, actually, people involved with D&D &D coming out. But I get to handpick my people, right? Yeah. I can talk to... I can talk to people that have games that nobody's ever freaking heard of, but I'm like, I want to talk to you because I read your game and there's something going on here and I need to figure out what it is. Um, so <clears throat> as much as I think we all strive to have full-time jobs in this industry, it's interesting that there's benefits for it not being your full-time job. Yeah. yeah. I, mean, I, th I think it goes back to that, that earlier question you said about like, you know, D and D taking over everything and, and do you have to be in D and D? I mean, yeah. clearly you don't have to be in D and D to, to make money, but it, but it's tough. Yeah. It, it is, it is harder to, to find an audience. And I'm in the same way. And the actual play podcast is tiny. We have a handful of people in there and we're always doing play tests of new games or uh, just a game that we're excited about or a hack of a game. Like right now they're, we're streaming Bounty of the Week, which is a Star Wars hack of Monster of the Week, which is like never, ever going to turn into anything. Like it can't. It's a Star Wars hack. We don't have Star Wars license. We're just playing, right? Like, yep. and, and it feels in that way. Like it's like this is the kind of stuff we just have at our table, right? It isn't we're doing it because of promotional reasons. We're doing it because of, yep. you know, but that's a luxury. Absolutely. Right. Exactly. Exactly. All right. We've got we've gotten five questions asked, five questions answered. Sean, you have one more. Yes. My question for you, Greg. When I was listening to the last episode, again, I'm going to keep shelling and plugging this last I episode. Lo I love this, you, Sean. I this, love this, you. It was a really it was a really good it was a really good interview. You know, um, uh, Craig's very Craig's very insightful, a very good listener. Uh, John's uh, even even when I know some of the answers, I'm like I I know the answer to this, but I still want to hear this this version of it because you'll you'll get something new. So even if you've heard 20 interviews of John Harper, listen to uh, the last one uh, uh, that Craig did because there's there's lots of really good insights in there. One thing I kept hearing you say during the interview, Craig, was like, man, I'm just getting back, like I'm just getting back to this stuff. I I, my, I I was I was familiar with GURPS, and now I'm looking at Blades in the Dark. And I'm really curious. I I feel like both John and I have just been like in it, like mm -hmm. like, head, like like head like buried in the quagmire of games for through that period, right? And, and so all three of us have played GURPS, right? All three yeah. of us have have played. Uh, you just recently played uh, for the Queens, you know. Yeah. So uh, uh, play the consideration. But Greg, you had this big skip in the middle. Mm -hmm. And I wonder what your insights about um, play culture and about, yeah, not so much industry. I mean, you can talk about industry if you like, but like, I, I wonder about your, your insights about like, what was it like sitting at a table when you're playing GURPS versus like, what's it like sitting at a table when you're playing Blades or Agon or For the Queen or 
So let me let me rifle off other <laughs> rattle off other evil hat publishers. Is there a common publisher among your examples, Sean? <laughs> <laughs> or Slayers um, or Undying or Golden Sky Stories, as I'm looking at the, the, the books behind John. Um, uh, yeah. So, so I, I make the joke a few times that I'm like the Rip Van Winkle of RPGs because um, I stopped playing right around when I was 18, 19 years old. Um, went to college, played a little bit in college, but not really, and then did nothing. Got married, got divorced, got married again, like, and then um, got back, got into miniature gaming, uh, which was a, something brand new for me. But that was I did in my thirties, and then COVID hit, couldn't do miniature gaming, and I was like, God, you know what I freaking love? I love role playing games, and I haven't done it since I was nineteen. So I was like, Yeah, I'm going to buy the newest edition of GURPS because when I left, that's what I played, right? And um, so I get, I get to the new, the latest edition of GURPS and not a whole lot has changed. Um, but it didn't get me excited. And then, um, pop on the internet and I'm like, what the hell? Like, like before there was like GURPS champions, D and D right. And call of Cthulhu. Call of Cthulhu yeah. Right. Um, now it's just like, and like, and I went to itch and I'm like, what the hell yeah. happened? And, and then, um, and John, it was your game, but uh, someone was like, you got to check out Blades. So I'm like, cool, like grab it. And I'm like, what the fuck is he even talking about? Like, <laughs> what, what is this? You know, cause I had not, I, I had not seen PBTA, right? I have not seen any of this. So everything had changed. And there was a period of time that it, it was hard for me to get my head around it. Um, because I came from a very GM centric play culture back in, you know, back in the early nineties, late eighties. And I came into something very different. And my first reaction was, was resistance, Mm -hmm. um, until I gave it a shot. Then I'm like, Oh my God, this is the greatest thing ever. Right. And, and, and like GM before and GM now, like bounds difference. And I didn't realize the way we play games now, Sean, I didn't know I needed it. Um, I didn't know how good it was and I wasn't there for the development. Part of the reason the podcast is focused on what it's focused on is because me trying to fill in these gaps, me trying to understand how we got here um, and, and how did things change? Cause it didn't happen overnight. There were iterations, you know, and then I, I find out through John about the forge. Then I go, you know, find Ron Edwards and I interview him and then I get, you know, and I just like slowly start piecing this together. Um, and that's a part of the podcast, but, um, it's amazing where we are and there is so many different ways to play. And the the shared table, I'm still getting comfortable with. Um, I'm still getting used to not prepping as much, getting Mm -hmm. used to saying, I thought it was going this way, but that's not like that's not interesting. Let's go. Let's stay with interesting and just getting a lot more comfortable with that. (laughs) Um, But I'm piecing it together, Sean. I don't know exactly how it happened, Um, but it it is very, very interesting. And I made a, uh, a. Shannon Applecline joke about the book. Um, yeah. I'll plug his book or uh, his books because that has helped me a lot because he does an unbelievable job of laying out this happened, then this happened, then this happened. And he has been instrumental in me understanding kind of the evolution of how ideas built on ideas and the bakers say this, and then Ron Edwards says this, and then John Harper says that's garbage. And then, you know, and all of a sudden out from <laughs> I all doubt of it, it. I doubt, <laughs> it. I doubt John Harper's <laughs> contribution was garbage. out from all of it though, suddenly like, this is how we play games now. Right. Yeah. And then we do that for a while. And then somebody comes in from left field and says, who needs a GM? Okay, morning star, talk to me. What are we doing here, right? And next thing you know, so it's it's very very interesting. Um, so it, it has been it's been awesome. But the biggest the biggest difference I've seen to answer your question is um, everything was a dice roll before. Everything was the G- GM centric before. The GM had a story, and if you wanted to listen, grab a character sheet. What has changed is now it's let's let's play games. Um, and, and let's build stories together and let's, let's make things interesting. And for me, <clears throat> much better way to do it. I've played around with some of the OSR games and I, you know, yeah, I remember that and stuff like that, but even those are being played different than mm-hmm. they, than they were before, right? Like you can go play DCC and it's not like playing D and D in the eighties. Like I did. Um, it's changed. It's like permanently changed. Um, and look at, look at how D and D is played now. So I don't know yeah, if that answered it or not, Sean. 
Well, it's funny because I, I have played some OSR games and been like, oh, yeah, this feels nostalgic for what I did in the 80s, but we're not trying to actually reproduce it. Like, we're not actually trying to do the same thing because there are parts of that that we hated and they're, yeah. and we're, we're going to pick and choose. I, I feel similarly in my uh, experience that like, oh, things have improved in so many ways. But I wonder, I'm not, not to like poke at our beautiful hobby because I love it, but I wonder, do you, is there anything you feel like we've lost? Is there anything you feel like, like, oh, man. Back in the day when, you know, uh, you only got 10 hit dice and then you started adding hit points after level 10 or, you know, or, or back in the day we had uh, the, the minis, the props, the whatever. Was there anything you feel like you're hankering for? So I'm going to half answer your question. Um, the beautiful part is, is that it's all out there for me. Right. So I don't have to miss anything, Sean. Right. Because there's so many goddamn games. I had five yeah. games to pick from <laughs> before. Right. Yeah. And now I can pick through it. Um, but, and that leads me to like, there's certain things that I enjoy. Right. So horror is my favorite genre. Mm. Um, I love running horror games. I love playing in horror games. Um, I like there to be high stakes. I like death to be on the table, um, but it needs to be meaningful and, and, and make sense. Um, and I had, I just, I curate and go find those games. Right. Yeah. And, and I can, and I can, ha I can have that, um, at the same time. So I don't miss it. Um, I used to, um, I used to be a very visual person when I game. So a lot of handouts, pictures, this is what this looks like, um, over describe things. I think one big change too is giving a couple nuggets and then I'm learned that the players are going to paint a much better picture than you are. And mm -hmm. then, and there might be times where you have to realign those pictures, right? That, that, that the player thinks it's one thing and the GM thinks it's the other thing. And you realize that you were thinking way different things. <laughs> and then you, you negotiate that and say, okay, this is what it was. And then, but like learning all that stuff. But like, if you had gone back to 18 year old Craig and like put, <laughs> apocalypse world in front of me i'd be like like this doesn't make any sense whatsoever you know um <laughs> but yeah it's awesome it, uh, it it is awesome and it and it's actually a, a nice circle back right when we talking about D, D at the very beginning um where it is the golden age um the amount of creatives out there um uh the generosity of this group um one quick call out though um and it's the opposite of what you asked me because i think you said you know concerns or stuff that you're worried about one thing i will give this um hobby credit to versus miniature gaming um miniature gaming has come has made progress um so that there's less people that look like me that that play miniature games um and it's become a little bit more inclusive um and um it's nothing compared to the RPG industry though. I think one of the things that has made me love it so much is how open and how uh, progressive the industry has become and how uh, diverse it has become compared to a lot of the other geek hobbies. A lot of the other geek hobbies out there right now still look like me. Um, and you know, are a bunch of guys that we used to play in the eighties and nineties and the RPG industry has broken through that in a way that I've not seen in anything else in board games or anything else. There's something special about the RPG industry that has allowed that to happen, which is cool. Yeah, I think that's, I, I, I really, uh, want to see that growth, growth continue. I mean, that's something where, you know, Evil Hat looks a lot at what we're publishing and, you know, how many of our creators are, are white creators, how many of our creators are just men, you know, and, and like, and the answer was like, historically a lot, uh, but, <laughs> but, but if you look at the last, you know, five years uh, or I don't know exactly when the shift really, really started, but like it is, uh, it is, it is moving, uh, we're moving away and we're moving to being a much more inclusive space. And I think we're, you know, behind the times. I think that, that there's a oh, lot no of question. space out there that are way more yeah. uh, diverse and inclu inclusive. Uh, and it's a matter of like, we're not a big company, but we're big enough with enough things in the pipe that we don't, can't shift. You know, it usually takes us three years to make a game. So I can't, if I want to make a change now, you don't see that. It's not sitting in your hand until three years, until right. three years from now. But it's still something we've been working on. And I, I agree, I'm really excited about the development of the people who are playing games and, and people who are making games too. Yep. And it's that diversity of thought. It's not a coincidence that this, the best games are happening now, right? The best of the best of what's coming out right now compared to what we've ever had. This is, this is the golden age. And part of it is because 
the doors opened, right? And we yeah. and it became much easier um, for people to push things out. All right, so real quick, um, let's do plugs. Sean, what is I, I want to know about a crime? What is the biggest crime? What is something that you're involved with that is not played enough? What do you want to plug? What is something that I'm involved with that is not played enough? It okay. Um, wow, this is you're really setting me up here to shell here. So it is it is criminal. It is criminal that the um, that the fantastic list of improv games and advice in Improv for Gamers, written by Karen Twelves, who is also my wife and is also just a fantastic editor, fantastic teacher, fantastic improviser, uh, is out of print and uh, ha- and uh, hasn't uh, uh, it doesn't see as much play as it as it can. And in response to that, we are going to be crowdfunding a second edition that has Beautiful. that has tons of new exercises. It has, I think, over a dozen, maybe fifteen contributors who have written new exercises, have written uh, advice on playing on, on improv games online, advice on uh, adapting the games to your your group so you can play improv games as your characters in your whatever game you're playing, uh, adapted games for accessibility. Uh, nice. and, and there's just so much, uh, it's, uh, as soon as, as soon as Karen published it, she's like, Oh, I, I should have included this game. Oh, <laughs> I should have included this advice. In fact, the very first thing that happened is we started streaming games of it. And she's like, I didn't write anything about playing it online. Like there's so many, yeah. and we adapted it, but it was like, there was all these things where as soon as it came out, she realized there was more that could be in it. And I'm super excited that we're going to be That's cool. crowdfunding second edition of it. Um, and what's the name again? Improv for gamers. Improv for gamers. Very nice. Yeah. All right. For you, Mr. Harper, what is the crime? What is something that you're involved with that is just, it's criminal. It's not played more. Hmm. Um, it's tough to say. Uh, I, I'm lucky that a lot of the things I'm involved with are get, I get played a lot. Uh, <laughs> Dig deep, John. Go, so, go figure out. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, uh, I, I guess it, just in general, I would say the Forge in the, in the Dark community um, has there's over a hundred like finished published Forge in the Dark games. Um, so there's another hundred probably that are that are in various stages of of um, early access or play testing or whatever. Um, and I I there are members of, of that group. Um, both finished and and in progress games that uh, I think could get a lot more attention. And in in general, I think they get a decent amount of attention compared to um, someone who's trying to get noticed just doing their own thing outside of a community like that. Um, But uh, some that come to mind right away are uh, Crescent Moon, um, which is a very like uh, heartwarming um, adventure game uh that's very very it's like on the complete opposite end of the spectrum from blades in the dark uh and it's got beautiful art by the author emma um and uh it's out it's it's finished it's it's beautiful uh and i think it's a really great example of how to adapt um the forge in the dark sort of foundation into something completely different. That's cool. uh, so it's really good for designers to look at whether you're doing forge in the dark work or not. Uh, yeah. it's, I think it's always instructive to see how someone um, can think through that process of adaptation uh, and, and mechanical innovation there. Um, but also it's just cool to have more games like wonder home back here behind me um, that, you know, just are, is doing, they're doing something that, that traditionally role-playing games haven't touched on much. Uh, there, there have been a few in the past, but we're seeing like way more, uh, designs come out that are in that space of not, um, they're not focused on violence. They're not focused on, um, uh, characters in, in dire circumstances, (laughs) um, which is my, what I prefer, but, uh, (laughs) it's, it's really cool to see, um, people doing other stuff. And, um, I think Crescent Moon is a great example of that, uh, but there's there's tons there's um, um, Ali Bustian's work especially I think is really interesting. Nice, um, misbehaving, and um, I think it's still called Heist. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think the so. um, uh, really cool one shot um, 
and, and it's essentially the core Blades in the Dark stuff, but it's really short and concise, and you play it as a one-shot, and it feels like you're playing Blades just instantly. <laughs> it's, like, really That's cool. trimmed down and cool. And um, I think people who are curious about uh, games in that family, because um, there's so many it now um, to, to choose from, I think uh, games like Heist are, are really a great on-ramp if you're curious about that kind of stuff. Uh, and I don't see people talking about that nearly enough. I think Heist is a really good uh, sort of sampling um, of that whole family of games that you can get to the table really quickly, and it yep. d- doesn't require a lot of um, investment and learning and stuff. So, uh, yeah, I, Crescent Moon and Heist are, would be my my answer right now. Uh, I, I'll, although I, I don't know for sure if Crescent Moon is, is not getting played enough. I think people are playing it, but, uh, <laughs> I want to I play it anyway. He he goes, he's playing right off. Yes. <laughs> All right, beautiful. I, I Gentlemen, this was fun. To the, uh... Yeah, yeah. This yeah, was this was great. I really appreciate you both coming on. Um, Sean, I'm going to get you on the podcast. You and I have already talked about that, so we'll put that together, um, piece it together, and we'll figure out another excuse to get you back on, John. It's always good hanging out with you. Oh, yeah, um, for those of you that are um, watching on YouTube, in the chat, um, I'm in the process of planning the second RPG roundtable, and I need some ideas. So who would you like to see in the circles above me? Who do you think would uh, really uh, excel in this format? Just let it, let me know in the comments. And uh, you watch the whole thing, too, like everybody in chat and everything. So I appreciate that. Take care, everybody. episode subscribe to tabletop talk and share it with your friends check out our content on youtube and twitch follow us on twitter and facebook and stay updated on everything coming from third floor all the links are in the show notes take care floor heads still here wow um well the episode is over but if you're bored why not go to patreon.com and support the show for as little as a dollar a month yeah you can just scroll down scroll down and yeah get the link it's patreon that makes this and all of our other content possible don't you want to join the other floor heads on the patreon discord anyway Thanks for sticking around. Take care.